everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the future of privacy, preserving tech, and how that affects advertising. I have two amazing guests today, Sir Martin Sorrell, who is the founder and executive chairman at S4 Capital, and Martin Britton, who is the president of EMEA at Google. And gentlemen, would you just take a minute each and just tell us a tiny bit about you and what you do? Matt, would you go first, please? Yeah, uh, Karen, thank you. It's great to be with you and Martin and everybody today. Um, I am uh, responsible for Google in Africa, the Middle East and Europe. So trying to make sure our products work for all the different users there, supporting companies who want to use tools to grow and uh, do the best we can to bring the best of the web to every citizen and company and country across that large region. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sir Martin, please. Yeah, Martin Sorrell, Executive Chairman of S4 Capital. We, we started about uh, three and a half years ago, a purely digital operation, trying to establish a new advertising and marketing services model because we think it's time in a 24-7 always-on world and we're going to get into data and privacy or whatever. It's important to have a focused digital operation. We think, secondly, it's important to use data for the creation, production, distribution of content through digital media in a continuous loop. We think it's important to go to market as faster, better, cheaper in that ag a need for agile, understanding companies such as Alphabet and Google in, in, deep, in deep detail uh, and being efficient. And lastly, having a, a unified, a, a one P&L, we think is really important in terms of delivering a, 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 a contemporary offer for our clients. So, that's what we're at. Wonderful. Thank you, Anne. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Karen Tiber Leland. I'm the founder of Sterling Marketing Group. I'm a branding and marketing strategist. I'm also a columnist for Inc.com and the author of The Brand Mapping Strategy. So let's just jump right in, Sir Martin. I'd love to ask you the first question. And I, I really want to know how you're seeing the process of first party data in a privacy first world right now. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, we do three things, really. We, we create, produce, distribute content. We, we examine data and analytics, and develop analytics and, and pump, pump, use that data, pumping it out through digital media, such as, such as Matt's, Matt's company, Alphabet and Google. And last but not least, we're involved in uh, technology services more recently, focusing on digital transformation. And um, in that world, and, I, and it's great to have Matt here because, you know, Google have been a prime mover in, in dealing with the issues around brand safety, transparency, privacy, safety for our kids and whatever. All, all those are issues, interference in political elections or, or suggested, perceived in, 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 in interference in elections. Uh, in all those things, I think Google has been one of the, the, the prime movers in trying to develop a safer environment for consumers uh, more generally. And as a result of that, as a result of, I think, are two things, really. One, Google's move on, on third-party cookies, which I think uh, Matt obviously will get, get into, and also what Apple has done around uh, changing the, the rules and regulations around IDFA, that has driven our clients back to first party data. That is data, and there's a lot of nomenclature here, here that is misused, but it really, first party data is data owned by clients. By definition, we can't own it because it's owned by our clients, but it's clients really researching and resourcing all the data that they have on their consumer's behavior, on motivation, use of media, buying of products and services and using that data in a cohesive analytical way together with the signals that Google and indeed other platforms provide using that data, using both those sources to come up with um, insightful content, which is then distributed through digital media and then refined looking at the results. So first party data has really become um, I shouldn't use the word new oil because it would be extremely unfashionable. It's, we should call it the new renewable energy, I guess, that, um, that our clients are using. And it's amazing what has happened. You know, I remember I was in, in the Middle East in January of 2020, just before COVID. 
And I remember very clearly there were two blogs that came out uh, that Google put out, one around that time, maybe a little bit before. And I remember having a, um, a, a very uh, interesting discussion. Um, it, was on, it was on similar devices that we're using at the moment uh, across the world, across the West Coast, uh, and uh, from Mountain View and uh, in the Middle East. And we were talking about the implications of that first blog that came out from Google on the deprecation or, or elimination of third-party cookies and what the significance was and what they were going to do uh, in the Google sandbox and how they were going to develop their approach. So um, really, it has been a, a fundamental driver of client attention and concern. And I have to say, clients often don't have, Matt will know far more about this than me, but they often don't have the systems integrated in a meaningful way. Sometimes they don't have the first party data or they haven't collated it, collected it. Or if they do, they've grown by acquisition or they've grown with different CTOs or CMOs having different systems and they have systems that don't talk to one another. So it, it sounds simple and it is, but we're spending a lot of time trying to pull together first party data platforms or systems inside clients into a meaningful and coherent way and then using that data in an effective way to, to create content uh, and to c continuously relook at the effectiveness of, of creative as it's pumped through the digital media system. So that's no, re it, really an important business. It, a it's really interesting important business for us. Because you're talking about this and we're, you know, 2022 and all of the technology way that technology impacts this. But I know Matt, you said that web the web advertising system is actually based on tech from 1994. So yeah. it seems like the tech is quite old, even though, as Sir Martin is saying, we're starting to use the tech in some new ways. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, look, I think it's sort of in these moments of big change, it's always quite helpful to look, look at a bit of a longer context. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, a Netscape engineer invented the cookie back in 1994 because mm -hmm. it's quite helpful to be able to, when you come back to a website, remember you know, what language preference you had or whatever. And then it became used as a tool for personalized, targeted advertising evermore. Um, I mean, I guess I, I start looking at this from, from that perspective. We're in a world where the tech acceleration of the last two years means that we are all so much more conscious of the role of technology in our lives. I think hugely positive. But as Martin says, you know, any technology can be used for good and bad. And what we see um, is not just the advertisers and the, um, the agencies that Martin represented, but also people and governments uh, and technology companies all looking at this area. So um, last year, the searches for online privacy on Google went up by 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we research our users in Europe, we set thousands of users. We asked last year about this. Only 21 percent of them feel in control of the data that's collected about them. And 69% of the Europeans we surveyed said they think the amount of the data is collected makes it difficult to protect their privacy. So you've got a problem. Is Google, is Google actually worried about privacy? Of course, uh, and, and, and always have been, uh, actually. So I'm just sort of saying, we, we've reached this point. Why have we reached this point? Well, people are much more conscious because of the role of technology in their lives. But also, you know, Google was born of the open web, right? We're the search engine. We want you to find stuff uh, online and we want you to get there as quickly as possible. So our kind of business model, if you will, has never been based on knowing anything about you. It's just like if you're searching for cycling shoes right now, we'll connect you to people who sell them. And that's been really what's made our model successful. And um, we've always had at the heart of our, our thought about user privacy, two key principles, transparency and choice. You know, you should know what data is being used about you and you should have the choice to turn it on or turn it off. And mm -hmm. actually, two years ago, we built our privacy engineering center in Munich. So our German engineering team there builds our controls for you anywhere in the world, whoever you are. The, the German team there in Munich is building is building the Google account so you can turn on and off your settings. And uh, 20 million people a day come to the Google account and sort of look at their setting and make changes. So we want you to have that control. But we're in this moment where consumers are saying we're concerned. Advertisers are wanting to make sure that they get value for money, but they also don't want to annoy people. People like Martin, with a huge experience of, you know, traditional print advertising and TV and all these industries where advertising actually fueled amazing content, 
are now coming with new technology and saying we need to do this we need to do this better and, and Google's absolutely trying to find a way to help us to have a free or affordable and open web with amazing content and services funded by advertising, where the advertising works for Martin's customers and where users feel their privacy is protected. And we believe that is entirely possible, but we've got to make some changes in the rules and the tools and the practices that we have to go about that. Well, and as you're talking, you know, it's not a simple thing to do. It's fairly complex. There's a lot of complexities in this. And I think one of the questions is just being devil's advocate for a minute, is web advertising too complex to reform? And, I, and I'd love to hear both of your, your takes on that. I mean, I, I don't think so <laughs> at all. I think, yeah, there's lots of complexity and there's lots of intermediaries and there's lots of innovation that's happened. But actually, if you start with a kind of clear and principled approach here, which is I want users to have control and I want them to have choice and transparency. And as Martin was just starting to talk about, like if I'm a company and I'm wanting to have a relationship with my users, every company today needs that relationship to exist online, even if they also have it offline. And that's where the sort of first party piece comes in. So if you're thinking about asking a visitor to your, to your website, a digital customer for some data, you know, I'd say there's kind of three things. One, you want to tell them why you want the data. Uh, two, you want to make it meaningful, understandable, and memorable. Like, what, what, you know, why is it a meaningful thing for you? I want your data so I can spam you with advertising. No, I want your data so that I can help you find the most useful stuff. So when you come to this website, I can give you things which, which you love. And um, you, you also need to make sure they have control, as I've said, to opt in and out. I think you start from those principles. You build a relationship from, uh, of, of trust. And then you can look at combining that with other sources of data that are not necessarily about knowing you individually, that can give the user that protection, but also can allow a company to delight those users when they visit. What do you- no, just, just to add Please, to that, yes. I, mean, I, I, think, I think that um, you have to be, regulation, you, you said, is it too complex for, for Google to do? Um, I think it's very complex for the regulator. If you look at the, the efforts that uh, were made by the EU, for example, around GDPR, we can all debate that and what the motivation was. I know that the <clears throat> commissioner has, has denied it was um, to, to restrict the power of the, the larger pla platforms. But the net result of GDPR is to be is to be to restrict competition for the bigger platforms. So I think what's happened is the smaller and medium-sized companies, because of the bureaucracy around it and because of the regulation around it have hesitated to expand for example into Europe the mid-sized companies and the small sized companies because it's become too too complicated and I actually I think Google and I sort of hinted at this I think Google made a very brave decision when they made the the decision around third-party cookies because theoretically it could have hindered their business quite significantly but in the long run, I think from a consumer choice point of view, Matt was talking about transparency and choice. It was really important to establish that that was the principle. Google at that time was a trillion dollar company. I think it's crossed two trillion dollars subsequent to that. It has done extremely well and continued to build its market position. But it's done it because I think it's understood the complexities of what we're talking about. And I just one one other thing I, I, I want to say as a result of sort of current events, uh, how important it is to have tech companies of quality and I would say scale. I, I, not, not an argument that many will use, I know. But I think one of the lessons of recent events, uh, the war in Ukraine, et cetera, is the importance of having very strong – you've got to have a healthy digital ecosystem – there has to be healthy competition. But at the same time, the danger of regulation is that you do hinder the growth and development of very strong tech companies. And we're seeing it not just in the West, by the way, we're seeing it in the East as well. So be careful what you, what you, what you ask for. And the other thing I want to say to you, Karen, is this, is that uh, and I think the platforms, not just Google, but I think the same thing applies to Meta uh, and indeed to Amazon too, are, are probably a little bit too shy uh, in pointing out that their platforms are really the engine of growth for small and medium-sized companies. 
which in yeah. turn are the, growth, are the growth engines for employment. And if you go back to what Matt mentioned around the pandemic and how important that was in accelerating digital acceptance and transformation, if you go back to the pandemic, a lot of those small and medium-sized businesses would not have survived and would not have prospered, quite apart from government aid, if they didn't have the help of the platforms such as Google for, for, for selling and distributing and marketing their products. And I will take it one step further. Not only would some not have survived, but there's a whole group of people that created new small businesses during the pandemic where that would not have been possible without what you're talking about. Right. So let, let me just ask you sort of again on the other side of this, what do you think the consequences are for the advertising industry if this doesn't happen? This being what exactly? Kirk? Well, this just being the whole um, the whole way that we manage first party data, the way that we manage privacy. Like what what is the consequence for an advertising agency, uh, advertising industry, excuse me, if they don't achieve this kind of first party data well, privacy? Well, let me just jump, uh, jump in there. I, you know, we are a purely digital operation. I look at uh, the figures, the media industry globally was about 750 billion last year. Uh, of that, 60% was digital with Google having the, the most significant market share, um, but along with the other platforms in the West, and then, then the, the three, Alibaba, Tencent, and ByteDance, or TikTok uh, in the East, and TikTok obviously expanding internationally. I mean, it, it, uh, digital dominates. Uh, digital will be 74% of that industry uh, in 2024, 2025. So the, the consequences for the advertising industry of not getting it right uh, are very severe. I mean, we see all the growth. Uh, and just one other very, I think, really interesting fact. It, advertising as a proportion of GDP used to be around 2% in the 1970s, 80s, 1990s. It shrank to about 1%. Uh, until recently, it picked up to about one and a quarter percent and is forecast mm. to go to about one and three quarters percent. Mm. The reason it's gone from one to one and three quarters or will do to one and three quarters is purely because of the growth of digital. So the, 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 growth, the growth of the industry, the growth of employment in the industry, the success of continued employment in the industry is dependent on a healthy digital sector. Without that, there will be no growth and advertising would be probably less than 1% uh, of GDP. So it's absolutely critical. I mean, the, in my view, that the platforms, and I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, dis, whether we, we should discourage competition. I'm not saying that, but we should have a healthy ecosystem, as I said before, but the health and growth and prosperity of the digital platforms is important from a small business point of view, a medium-sized business point of view, and from the advertising industry, it's absolutely crucial. The older models are suffering, and they suffer in direct proportion to the proportion of their revenues that come from traditional media. I mean, the higher the traditional media, the more they suffer. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things is you look at, obviously, I've, I've written a lot of books and, and helped people write a lot of books. I think one of the places that you see this, although they're not advertisers, is in publishing. They have failed to keep up with the way that this is all managed in a modern world. And you really see that having an impact. And I think part of what we're talking about is advertisers, if they keep looking at the way it was and trying to apply those models, even if they're trying to apply old models to new technologies, they will have an issue. They will have yeah. a problem. And, and Karen, look, I think, you know, it's really important to think about there are, there are three people in this marriage, right? There's the user of the internet, the consumer, the reader of books, the lover of games, the watcher of TV shows. There's the advertiser, and um, uh, there's the uh, ad industry, ad industry, the publisher, the content creator. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So you, you've got to balance what the users are looking for with what advertisers are looking for, and the ability to earn a return on the content you're creating, whether it's newspaper, um, journalism, or or book publishing, or whatever. And I think what we're looking for here is to find a new balance. As Martin said, what's happened? Users have voted with their feet, right? We're all consuming huge amounts of content online on our phones much of it from traditional media companies. The media companies are struggling with catching up with that shift in eyeballs and attention. 
and are shifting their business models. Now, many of them doing it really well, um, but they're finding it painful. And then the advertising industry has to navigate this shift, shifting its money, making sure it's getting return on investment in this world of, of change. And then, as you mentioned, let's come on to sort of the regulatory side. You know, if we're working with 1994 invented cookies, we're also working with a rule book, you know, that's 22 years out of date in Europe. Most of the technology we use every day wasn't envisaged when, you know, those rules uh, were, were put in place. So we absolutely need updated regulation. Um, but as Martin says, you know, you, the complexity of the technology and the pace of change means you need a sort of framework. You then need engagement within that framework and you need to sort of see the innovation move along. And that's why, you know, we feel the responsibility very clearly at Google. You know, there are, there are important discussions to have. And, and let me just give you an example. You know, in Europe, we, uh, we sat down with the UK regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the privacy regulator, and the Competition and Markets Authority, which is the competition regulator. Because if you say, well, we want total privacy for, for users, what you, mean, what you mean is we ain't going to be able to fund any journalism online. We ain't going to be able to fund through targeted advertising a whole bunch of the content services products you rely on every day because targeted advertising generally gives you a five plus times return on your investment compared with untargeted advertising. It could be bigger. So you've got to get that balance right where you're um, trying to ensure you've got a um, competitive market that supports original content that also works for advertisers and that is privacy safe. And that's where I think we're going because we know that Go back to my consumer research. If consumers feel they have control, they're three times more likely to respond to advertising, twice as likely to find the advertising relevant. And actually, you know what? People find online advertising relevant and helpful. Google has built a business by doing that with search. And actually, we help lots of those websites, newspapers monetize. I think $14, $15 billion we paid out last year to um publishers of websites to help them make money uh, online. So that's why I think Martin's point on scale is so important. And then final point, I think, you know, we, we're very conscious at the moment of the, the horror of the war in Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis, but the battle for misinformation is, or against misinformation, the battle for truth is really, really important here. And building tools that at scale can fight back is really important. So just one example in, in Ukraine, uh, we use Project Shield, which is putting our infrastructure in front of public websites, news organizations, government websites, so that um, attacks by sort of putting spam traffic in that takes them down, DDoS attacks and so on, uh, can be protected against so that people can get access to that information. We work incredibly hard on disinformation. That, that, you know, the time I'm speaking to you, YouTube and search are available in Russia. So Russian citizens can actually access BBC, CNN, Western journalism, um, directly in their phones, uh, when most of the Russian local media has um, has stopped being able to publish. So it's a really important moment to get these trade-offs right. And, and as I say, we take our responsibilities really seriously here, not just to users and advertisers, but also to the content industry. Well, yeah, just to add to that. Just to add to just to I would say, that, I think what you just said oh, about the marriage yeah. of the three in this remark, and I'll get to you. I think what you yeah. just said about the marriage of the three is really, really important because I think that in the past, there's tend to be maybe an over-focus on one and the model that's getting created now is really a model where there's all three winning, if you will, right? All three being successful. And I think that's a really important point in the, in the way this shift is happening. Sir Martin, please. Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the analog response to the, the digital incursion is often a defensive one. It's a bit like King Canuton, the waves, uh, <laughs> and you try, you try and turn back the waves um, by taking defensive means instead of embracing the, the, the new technologies and trying, you know, if you look at the, the recent analysis uh, on what is happening to newspapers in the UK, for example, the ones that are doing best are the ones that really have embraced digital technology uh, aggressively and started to adapt their model uh, proactively instead of reactively. And uh, what Matt said about the, the 15 or 14 or 15 billion that they spend a year uh, in, 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 in editorial effectively for analog media, I think is a, a good, you know, I, I'm, it, may, it may enables you to understand what's been happening in reaction to those defensive moves. 
What do you think advertisers need to start doing in terms of like, what's the right approach in this new reality for them to offer a more meaningful and engaging experience? Well, I, you know, my, my view very strongly, and I think first party data and what I said about first party data at the beginning and its importance it is really a, a straw in the wind, if you like, about how advertisers have to organize themselves in this day and age. I mean, we, we have three models. We have the traditional outsource model. We, we have an embedded model where we embed our people uh, with the clients, obviously affected to some extent by what's happened with the pandemic, but that will continue to be the case where we, we basically make available people to clients on an almost, if not exclusive basis. And then the third one, the in-house model. I, I think where, where the client takes on board a lot of those functions. After 2008 and the great financial crisis, I think what tended, and there was that fashion, uh, nothing new, it's, it's been there before for zero-based budgeting. What tended to happen was that clients would outsource their functions. They would be reducing their cost. They actually lost a lot of marketing know-how and input as a result of doing that. And I think to use... Um, a much misused uh, tagline, take back control. I think clients have to take back control and working more closely with the platforms. We in our industry tended to think about a competitive relationship with the platforms. I think as we became more mature, myself included, we probably looked at it as a more, more a, a partnership where together we can develop a better modus operandi for our clients because our clients look in a 24 7 always on world you're wait, waiting for the agency to react with a, a for over three months with a tv film a 30 second or six it just doesn't work no. i'll give you the complete reverse which matt will be annoyed for me for, for mentioning but facebook right in italy i remember uh the the days the insight they came up with was that women spent less than two seconds on a post, uh, you know, on a, looking, looking at their phones on a, on, a, on a piece of content. And what we devised was a two-second commercial. And, and to, so you take the insight and you develop the format. You don't keep the old format for the, for the, for the new insight. So I think the answer, what clients have to do is they have to be much more in control of the process. They have to work much more closely uh, with the platforms uh, and they have to work much more closely with their agencies. And their agencies have to be structured, I think, totally differently. The, the old structure uh, of where you have account handling, where you have planning, where you have creative production, et cetera, doesn't, doesn't work. The silos don't work. They have to be united in a much more uh, visible and effective way in order to the unitary structure, the one PL where clients can have access. But it, immediacy of response is absolutely critical. So that tagline, which sounds very glib, faster, better, cheaper, I actually, or speed, quality, value, I think actually sums up what clients really need to do. And first party data is a very good example of what we're talking about. You have the data, you organize it internally, you access it, you make the insights available to create the content, you pump it out, you personalize at scale. You know, the work, for example, we do at Netflix uh, in, in various campaigns, we probably will produce something like 1.6 million potentially different executions. We'll probably mm -hmm. use 50 to 70,000 of them mm -hmm. intensively. But we look at what Karen's response is. We know she's a Man United supporter or whatever, and we'll compare the Netflix series that we're promoting to a football team or we know you're on wsj.com so we know you're interested in business we'll compare it or forbes.com and we'll compare it to uh, to a business or whatever business situation so it personalization at scale I think becomes that critically important and to do that you probably are going to have to have a different model it's probably going to have to be more embedded or more in-house. So I think those are the few things that they have to think about. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about what you're saying is this idea of personalization, but personalization that's about what the consumer, what the user is actually finding valuable, 
rather than what's being pushed on them by what the company wants to sell. Sure. That sounds sure. like such a simple, you know, an obvious change, but to me, that's a, a sea change. That's a world change right. in advertising. Matt, same question for you. What do you think advertisers need to start doing? What is the right approach for them in this new reality so they can offer a more meaningful and engaging experience? Yeah, so I, I think all of the above, Karen, um, and I go, go back to my kind of three parties in the relationship. I want to be clear that the user has the preeminence here, right? If you don't um, attract somebody with your great content and um, delight them with the advertising rather than annoy them, you don't have any business for an advertiser or to pay a content creator. So there's a primacy there. I think what we found is, you know, this, this is not gonna be solved by one player, neither Martin nor Google, uh, nor the Wall Street Journal or Netflix. What, what you do need is an industry level solution. And that's why, you know, the regulatory framework is important. Uh, principles like transparency and choice for users are important. And I think, you know, where we are in that is we saw what users were telling us. Uh, we, we saw that it was going to be possible to have a world where privacy and personalization could work hand in hand rather than be seen as opposites. And, and what we wanted to do, therefore, is um, build a path to that. So we announced that Chrome would, would no, lo no longer allow third party cookies, uh, which is one of the ways in, in which this uh, you know, th this needs to be unpicked. But then we listen to the industry. And what the industry said is, you know, we need more time to figure out the next solutions. And because it's so important to fund original content, to pay for the open and affordable web, we said, fine, well, let's, let's allow ourselves another two years, during which time we will produce within the privacy sandbox, which is an industry initiative to test and learn and try new things, a series of tools that we can use together that will help us to develop these pri privacy protecting technologies. And so we've been rolling out some of those and working with the industry uh, to do more on that front. As Martin says, you know, advertisers need to figure out their first party strategy, think about their data strategies and experts uh, such as S4 and their constituent um, group uh, companies can, can help to do that. And, and Google and others can help with tools as well. You need to figure out your, your sort of strategy. You then need to experiment with technology. So give you an example in Chrome, we've got something we call topics. And what that allows you to do is for a user to see uh, up to five topics that they are interested in based on their browsing behavior. It doesn't say this is Karen, it just says this user is interested in these topics, in you know, football, fishing, whatever. And that allows relevant advertising for that user. And that's the key here. It, it's not so much personalized as relevant. And it could be relevant to you in the moment because you're looking for a car and therefore you've been looking across websites around cars and car reviews, or it could be relevant in terms of long-term sort of interest. And I think that's the, that's the way forward. So I think over the next couple of years, more of a roadmap, more tools and testing, more working as an industry. And I think always really looking to the user as the, as the, as the peak of that relationship. We need to do things that delight users, that continue to allow them an open and affordable web. Because, you know, half the planet's online and we have, my God, we've needed the web over the last two years. We need it now, as we see in the kind of crises of, of information and disinformation. And the other half of the planet is coming online quickly. Um, and, and, you know, they want an open and affordable web and to enjoy mm -hmm. all the services that we have enjoyed today. And as Martin said, you know, it's also a huge engine of economic growth. You know, Google's advertisers, they're vastly uh, small businesses. The vast majority of small businesses, they can grow and export and create jobs and prosperity at three times the rate of those that aren't online. And it's a revolution in the economic model of business. It was never possible before because of this revolution in advertising. And so I think it's really exciting. And we've seen many businesses, as you said, created during the last two years, as people think about how they wanna spend their time. And they realize that they can build businesses like this. And so final thing for us is helping those entrepreneurs with digital skills. I think there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. They need to have the skills to bring the tools together and we need to make the tools as simple as possible to use. And then, you know, as they grow, they'll need the expertise of organizations like Martins to help them to make the best of these tools so that they can focus on what they're good at, which is, you know, designing and building products that are going to delight you and make you want to come back and spend more with them. And that creates the jobs, the exports and the, and the prosperity. You know, it's interesting because the word that comes to mind from what you both just said about this is nimbleness. You know, the the advertisers need to be nimble. The agencies need to be nimble. I think I think for just for myself, I got a dog recently. And of course, you can imagine since I Googled one thing about a puppy, 
I get every day just tons of things of toys and food and training. You know, I get all the dog stuff. I don't I think it's Google. It's stuff. not Google that's caused that. Some some other less uh, privacy sensitive. <laughs> but, uh, but the point <laughs> being, but the point being is that was a need. I if you had looked at my history as a consumer, you'd never see anything about yeah. that. And now all of a sudden, it's a need. And so the the nimbleness I think that agencies and advertisers have to have is this recognition, especially today that people don't exist really in as much of a static place yeah. as they used to, even in terms of where they live. That's absolutely right. And more than that, we have never had in our working lifetimes, even Martin, um, a period of such uncertainty. Because, you know, if you're running a business, you can't compare this year to last year or the year before or the year before. No. Plus, you've got the overlay of what's going to happen to consumers in a disposable income in this uncertain world. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to be agile to what's going on right now and you know i look at google trends all the time it's the best way to see what what's happening anytime governments <laughs> change their travel restrictions you could see immediately people starting mm -hmm. to research holiday destinations and so on so you need to be responding to that and the ways to do that are using digital and automation to make sure you show up with a helpful offer in the right place at the right time as that demand starts to return because we're all flying into fog this year and so I think there's an added incentive. It's not just that consumers are more dynamic. It's actually that we're we're flying through this fog of habits that are fundamentally resetting. And we don't know how they're going to reset. It's a huge opportunity, by the way, for entrepreneurs and businesses to reach out and find new customers and to compete more. So I think there's going to be a real, um, really dynamic environment over the next couple of years as, as this settles down. A big opportunity for entrepreneurs we in technology have to get it right. The advertising industry has to come there in service of, of users, first and foremost. Advertisers getting a return on their efforts. Uh, publishers being able to earn a return on you know, the work they're doing to create great content. All the while working with the regulatory framework that protects privacy and makes the web open and affordable for everyone. Yeah, but the problem, Matt, as you know, is that um, everybody claims to be agile. Uh, right. But the, rea the realities are very, very different. And uh, the, the way I look at it, you know, about 50 percent of our portfolio are with tech companies. And I and I think that there's a real issue here. I mean, I describe it somewhat inadequately as companies that look at the sky and companies that look at their boots uh, and the companies that look at the sky, the ones that are growing at 10, 15 or 20 percent organic really have a different attitude. And they are naturally more agile. It may be true that they're not analog companies and they're not analog companies that have tried to become digital companies. They don't have so much of a history. They're not a prisoner of their history. But I think it's a remarkable difference. The, the companies that look at their boots that are growing at maybe one, two or three percent tend to be more cost driven, tend to be more uh, procurement driven. I'm not saying anything against procurement people or procurement officers. So I think I think it really does need a, an attitudinal change. Our response to it and response to the sort of things that Google and the other platforms are doing is to broaden our offer such that we can engage not just with the CMOs or chief sales officers of companies, but also the IT functional and the tech people. Because when you look at digital transformation, it really hits marketing transformation, for example, hits three functions. It hits marketing, it hits sales, and it hits IT, and you have to bring the whole thing to get together. So our content and our data and analysis in digital media tend to be oriented towards CMOs or chief sales officers or chief digital officers. Our tech services practices or practice is very much orientated around CIOs and CTOs. So you have to hit the whole broad range in order to, to do it, but you have to do it in an agile way. And 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 I think the continuous frustration, to be blunt, that we have is that, again, the CEOs of many companies will say we're agile, but when you actually start to deal with them and wrestle with the silos, uh, it's, it's to, and, and the other thing, to Matt's point about you know, flying into the fog, you know, I think 22 will be a reasonably good year, obviously not as good as, as it could have been, but for this very terrible, terrible situation, in Ukraine, uh, obviously higher interest rates, a little bit of pressure on free trade or more than a little bit of pressure, the pressure on globalization, all going to lower the growth rate. But I think 23 will be a much tougher year. 
and uh, global GDP growth might be about three or four percent this year, but next year, you know, it might be down uh, one or two. And some people are saying that we might even go into recession. Certainly, some financial indicators may suggest that might be the case. That's when life is going to get tougher, and the sort of things that Matt mentioned, and I think I'm mentioning, will become even more important. I mean, when the heat is on, we saw this in COVID in the last week of March, first week of April of 2020, when the proverbial hit the fan and we were all panicking. We didn't know which, which were we certainly were. Matt wasn't, but we certainly were. But we, we, we didn't know what to do. But it soon became apparent that transformation, digital transformation was accelerated by that. And I think you're going to see another wave as we get into 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you both. It it went very quickly, which is always a good sign. Thank you both very much for your insights and your information. I know it's really helpful and useful for our audience. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank Thank you, you, Karen. Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you.